by him. Uh, I appreciate that. Uh, last summer, <coughs> I have published a book titled The Structure of World History in Japanese. Today, I would like to talk about the questions I proposed there. But before doing so, I need to talk about my book, Transcriptic on Canton Mars, uh, which I published nearly 10 years ago. I wrote this book in the 1990s. In this book, I, as the subtitle shows, I did a task of reading Kant via Marx and uh, Marx via Kant. Of course, this was not a matter of uh, comparing, comparing or synthesizing Kant and Marx. I, I had a different purpose. Between Kant and Marx, there is another person, that is Hegel. So reading Marx via Kant and reading Kant via Marx is nothing other than <coughs> reading Hegel from front and behind. In other words, the transcriptic was actually an attempt to critique Hegel from a new angle. I keenly felt the need to do so around 1990 when the revolution in East Europe broke out and uh, led to the collapse of the Soviet Russia. Around 1990, an American named, uh, named Francis Quirm, uh, is a uh, Japanese American, he made, <coughs> made it popular uh, uh, to talk about the end of history. Uh, Francis Quirm was a government official of the State Department of the United States. He studied with Alan Loon who was in turn the American disciple of Alexander Kojel. Kojel is a philosopher in France who thought of Hegelian notion of the end of history in various ways. Kuyama used this notion to theoretically legitimize the collapse of the communist regime and the victory of, of, the, of America. When Fukuyama spoke of, of the end of history, he meant to say that the revolution in Eastern Europe indicated the victory of liberal democracy and this would be the final revolution. There might be minor revolutions in the future, but no more revolutions that would change things in a fundamental way. And quite a few people mocked his view, but I think Fukuyama was right in a sense. To be sure, he meant to say that what happened in 1990 was the ultimate victory of the United States. He was wrong. At first, it seems that the hegemony of the United States was primarily established and the capitalist globalization and the new liberalism had prevailed. But now that 20 years have passed, it turns out that all of this has failed. As a result, virtually, Every country has adopted state capitalistic or social democratic policies to some degree. This may look like a change, as the United States, a U.S. President Obama calls it, and yet it does not overturn the notion of the end of history, but only, but only proves it. Neoliberalism has now been replaced by a welfare state capitalism or social democracy, but the latter does not negate the capitalist market economy. Rather, they acknowledge the capitalist market economy, but solve the problem it causes by means of uh, regulations and redistributions adopted and enforced by the state through democratic procedures. I call such system capital nation state. What Fukuyama said is that the uh, capital nation state is the final form of society and that there could be no further change to this form in a fundamental sense. The changes that took place recently are not, not a revolution. They represent nothing more than a cha change within the overarching system of capital nation state. That is why I said 
that these changes do not dis disprove the end of history, but in fact prove it. But people are not aware that they are locked in the circuit of capital nation state. So they believe they are making history while they are just running around inside the same familiar circuit. In other words, they have no imagination to go beyond the capital nation state. What then should we do to go, on, go beyond the end of history? Going beyond the end of history is nothing other than going beyond the capital nation state. For that purpose, there is a need to undertake a new critique of Hegel. In my view, it is Hegel in philosophy of right who understood that capitalist, <coughs> that capitalist economy, state, and the nation exist in a dialectically correlative system. This understanding unifies the three terms, freedom, equality, and fraternity, that served as the slogan of the French Revolution. Firstly, on the level of sensibility, Hegel finds freedom in <coughs> civil, regarding society, namely <coughs> the economy. Secondly, on the level of uh, the stand, he sees the state uh, in the form of its uh, bureaucrats as that which brings about equality by correcting the various contradictions brought about by the market economy. And finally, on the level of reason uh, of the financed, Hegel finds fraternity in the nation. In doing so, he dialectically grasps the capital nation state as a triadic system without excluding, excluding any moment of the constituent elements. The philosophy of right was not based upon the actual German society that existed at the time. It was rather a model after British society. Politically, for, for instance, Hegel bore in mind the constitutional monarch in Britain. The monarchy in Germany, Prussia, was only an enlightened <coughs> absolute monarchy at best. Also, economically, Hegel read Adam Smith well and even thought critically of capitalist society as the, the system of desire. He attempted to overcome it theoretically, even though industrial capitalism did not exist in, yet, yet in Germany. As a matter of fact, the world which Hegel grasped in philosophy of, of right, that is the capital nation state, did not exist yet in Germany. Therefore, this book was not meant to justify the status quo of German society. The world blasphemy this book did not exist only in Germany then. What is more, in a way, it has not come into exist, existence yet in many areas today. In Hegel's view, there would be no more fundamental change after capital nation state is established. Of course, there would be revolutions till, till they get established. But no more essential revolution once the capital nation state is established. Therefore, history ends then. That is Hegel's view. In fact, uh, there are many revolutions after Hegel. But there is no more fundamental change where the capital nation states are firmly established. In this sense, Hegel's philosophy of right is still valid. That means that the new attempts to critique it is needed. Otherwise, we cannot go beyond the capital nation state or the end of history. Most Marxists believe that Hegel's philosophy of right was fundamentally criticized by Marx, but I suppose that was not the case. Just like other left Hegelians, the young Marx began his work his criticizing Hegel, especially focusing on philosophy of right. However, uh, this was quite insufficient. While Hegel lays uh, <coughs> nation and state in the higher order, 
Marx regarded them as ideological superstructure, <coughs> which is determined by the economic infrastructure or economic base. The problem here is that Marx placed the state in this superstructure side by side with literature and philosophy. Hence comes two views. One is that the state and the nation would automatically vanish once the economic base was changed. The other is that uh, state and nation can be resolved through enlightenment since they only exist as ideology or communal, communal fantasy or representation. These views cause Marxist movements to stumble in major ways. Belittling the problem of the, the state gave rise to Stalinism on the one hand, and belittling, belittling the problem of the nation led, led to the defeat against the fascism on the other. Such failures served a uh, lesson to Marxists. Thereby, they began to pay more attention to the questions of the state and nation, and stress the relative autonomy of these entities. At the same time, they maintained the framework of historical materialism. In other words, they came to regard the economic base as the last instance uh, <coughs> which overdetermines the structure. But actually, they began to slight, slight of the economic base this time. They tried to find a key to understanding, understanding the autonomy of the state or nation on levels which are different from the economic base. They mobilized sociology and psychologists to plot up the argument. Such a view ended up regarding the state or the nation as communal fantasy or ideological representation uh, which can be eliminated by enlightenment. Generally, it may be said that thoughts that, which emphasize the autonomy of uh, superstructure led to postmodern <coughs> version of idealism, such as textual idealism. By contrast, I intended not only to deserve Hegel's idealist system materialistically uh, as Marx did so, but also to retain, retain the triadic structure of capital nation state. What is necessary for it is not to cast aside the economic base, but rather to destroy it by broadening or our understanding of it. <coughs> that is to say, what I attempted to do was to consider uh, infrastructure uh, a, not in terms of the mode of production, but in terms of the mode of exchange. Same history of social formation in terms of the mode of production is in fact uh, saying it in terms of who owns the means of production, such as the land. But I see the history of social formation from the mode of exchange. This view appears to diverge from Marxism, but it is not so different from Marx's view. For example, the young Marx used to express various things with the notion of interpol, which is a fair tale. The fair tale implies traffic, exchange, gift, war, sexual intercourse, and so on. It also implies metabolism, uh, stuff big so, material exchange as well. In that sense, production constitutes fair care between humans and nature. This idea is crucial from the ecological viewpoint. The idea of production without regards to exchange between humans and nature leads to environmental uh, destruction. In addition, the production as an exchange between humans and nature can only take place as part of the relations among people, namely the relations of exchange. Therefore, fair care or exchange should be considered as most fundamental. In my view, there are four modes of exchange. 
uh, it is closely gift and return the brand redistribution or domination theory and commodity exchange and X. Uh, these are illustrated in the diagram. Uh, <coughs> okay. Uh, diagram. Uh, uh, figure one. Mm. Any social formation in history involves three modes of exchange uh, which are combined. The social formations vary depending on which mode is predominant. For example, in primitive tribal society, mode A is predominant. Other forms of exchange also exist, but they are secondary and not, not conspicuous. In state society, the mode B is predominant. At a glance, the mode B does not seem to be the exchange, but when one obtains security by subordinating oneself to the other, it is an exchange. In the Leviathan, Hobbes grasped this type of exchange as a basis of the state. Although compelled by fear, it is a social contract of exchange. The state consists not in mere violence or conquest, but this kind of exchange. That is the mode B. In the state society, mode of exchange A remains in the form of an agrarian community, and mode C develop, develops as well in the form of commerce and the city. Nevertheless, these modes are under control of the state. In the meantime, the mode of C becomes dominant in capitalist society. But this does not mean that the other modes of exchange vanish. Mode, mode A and B remain, but they are transformed. For example, the feudal state becomes a modern state, and the agrarian community becomes the nation. Uh, in belief, the capital nation state is a form of social formation in which commodity exchange becomes predominant. That is the, the modern world system. I think Hegel grasped this in his way. I have just mentioned that three modes of exchange A, B, and C, but now I must add the fourth mode, D. The mode D recovers mode A on a higher level, uh, which is achieved through abolishing the, both the B-based state and the C-based capital. Mode D engenders a society in which exclusivity of community is regained, but individuals are free from bond, the bonds of community. Uh, you may call it communism or anything you like, but this mode of uh, exchange is non-existent, non unlike, unlike the former three modes. Uh, in fact, it appeared in the form of universal religion, in the ancient world empires, where the combination of the mode, mode A and B and C grew full fledged. Mode D is not based upon human wishes or idealization. Mode D emerges as what Freud called the return of the repressed. As Freud put it, when the repressed returns, it becomes compulsive. Therefore, mode D appears as the will of God rather than human wishes. The universal religions exist as a protest against the state, community, and money. Initially, they are critical of the institutional religions prompted by the state and the community. But as they grow in scale, they themselves become institutional religions of the empire states and communities. Nevertheless, there remain the elements of universal religion. <coughs> Such religions be became the instrument of the state, but at the same time, they conversely function to regulate the state. And the social movement always took religious form in the pre-modern societies. 
In this sense, it may be said that uh, any social formation consists of the four types of exchange. Uh, the mode of exchange did appear as, as socialism in, in the industrial capitalist society. But in, even in Europe, socialism was not detached from Christianity till, till the end, uh, middle of the 19th century. Socialism became scientific socialism, a notion first proposed by Proudhon. What he meant by the phrase scientific socialism had nothing to do with the state-controlled planned economy. Rather, he meant the association of corporate goods. This was both moral and economic. It is nothing other than the realization of mode D. The mode D is that which supersedes the triad of capital nation state. I mentioned these frameworks already in Trans Critique. I elaborated free on this in my latest work, The Structure of World History. But there is a considerable difference between these worlds. For instance, in Trans Critique, I observe social formation as a single one. It means to observe the state as a single one in isolation or observe the state from the inside. However, the state exists always against the other state. This is unnoticed normally because it becomes clear-cut in the wartime. Actually, I noticed it after 9-11 in 2001, as I will mention it later. I was aware that it is impossible to supersede the state within the state. Even if you attempt to supersede the state, you must fail, so long as the other state exists. Because the other state interferes with you, and you have to rebuild the state to defend your revolution. That is evident, but I never took it seriously. Uh, for, Ma, uh, for example, Marx wrote in German ideology, empirically, communism is only possible as an act of the dominant peoples, all at once and simultaneously. Uh, I, I call this simultaneous world revolution from now on. This idea was a truism in the middle of the 19th century Europe, shared by anarchists as well. But it does not seem that Marx paid further attention to the condition of the simultaneous world revolution, let alone other Marxists or anarchists. As a matter of fact, I did not take this matter seriously when I wrote uh, Transcritique. Of course, I never thought that the socialist revolution would be possible in a single nation in isolation. But I have some optimistic view about it in the 1990s. Now that the Soviet Union is gone, the counter movement against capital and state in the world can be free and equal. They may take place independently in each nation, but they will grow spontaneously interconnected and eventually united beyond borders. In this sense, I have a sympathy with Levy and Hart's view of the global vote of the multitude. I myself started new associates movement in Japan in 2000. However, the 9-11 and its ensuing incident shattered my optimism. In the first place, the war disclosed the nature of the state, which you cannot see within the state. Secondly, what is more important, uh, this instance splits the global solidarity of the counter movement. For, in, for instance, Negri and Hart left out all Al Qaeda uh, from what they call the vote of the multitude. Actually, Al Qaeda is a typical multitude against the state, nation, and capital. Al Qaeda does not belong to any 
nation or state. It has no locality except on the web. It's not a hierarchical organization. Anybody who agrees with it may call themselves al -Qaeda. And the members are high-tech brain intellectual workers, and so on and so forth. <coughs> I'm not saying that Nevian Hearts should support al -Qaeda. I'm just saying that they should admit the, <coughs> the fact the revolt of multitude in the world are actually split and divided. This proves that the counter movement against global capitalism is doomed to be doomed to be easily divided. Both the first international and the second international were broken apart because of the nationalist dispute among them. The question is how to evade this fate. As Marx put it, the socialist revolution which aims to supersede the state is impossible without simultaneous world revolution. But as I said before, uh, I do not think of it enough in SPT. This is shown by my view of observing the social formation as a single unit, disregarding its relation to others. Such reflection led me to think of the world where plural social formations relate to each other. I call this world system, following uh, Fernand Brodel, Brodel and Emmanuel Wallerstein. In my opinion, the world system has nothing to do with its size. No matter how small it can be the world system so long as it consists of plural social formation. Therefore, for example, the tribal confederacy is a world system. As a matter of fact, the, the European League in the, the North America was large enough, and yeah, large in size as well. So this tribal league or mini world system is based upon the principles of gift, the small A of exchange. This is a social contract to create peace by overcoming the natural state, as a war state, uh, by way of gift. This confederacy is different from the state, uh, which, as Hobbes rightly defined, is grounded on mode B of exchange. The world system next to the tribal league is the world empire which integrate many states and communities on the basis of mode A, mode B. <coughs> on top of it, there is the world system in, in which mode C develops. Uh, Brodel, Brodel called it the world economy, and uh, Emmanuel Wallerstein called it modern world system. Look at that. Yeah, well. yeah. In, the, in the modern world system, the capital nation states are pervading. They acknowledge each other and they incessantly cooperate and compete with each other. In order to overcome the capital nation states, we need not only to change each society, but also to change the world system. And how is it possible? Before proceeding to it, uh, let me refer to the project with some ideologues regard as overcoming the modern world system, namely the European Union. The ideologues in Europe maintain that this is a project to overcome the modern world system in, in the sense that it limits the modern political economic sovereignty of nations. But actually, this was formed under the very world system. The European Union was formed primarily against the United States and Japan before. But and this move triggered the move to form uh, a regional community in the world. And this community seems to be based upon memory of the cultural and religious communality in the past. 
The fact is that the memory of the antagonism and strife in the near past is passed on. But it is blocked by the pressure from outside. As Ernst Brunan put it, to form the nation, people need not only to remember the past, but to forget the past as well. The same is true of the regional community. If nation is, is imagined community, community as Benedict Anderson put it, the regional community is also imagined community. The point is that the regional community is not overcoming the modern world system. It is produced by a problem in the modern world system. It may go beyond the modern state, but do so by forming a super state, the world empire. In fact, this is a recovery of the old world empires without em emperors. This will lead, lead to the imperialist struggle worldwide. Therefore, it is impossible to overcome the modern world system in this, in this direction. Here, I'd like to suggest an another path, that is to form the new world system on the basis of mode D. In transcriptive, I just thought of D in a single social formation. But I reconsider from the world system in my recent book, The Scratch of World History. I found a key in Kant's notion of the world republic. Uh, <coughs> as as uh, stated earlier, I we consider Kant's theory, theory on perpetual peace uh, because of 9 11 and ensuing wars. One reason for that is the Japanese government decided to dispatch soldiers to Afghanistan and Iraq despite the uh, Japanese constitution, which involved Article 9 to prohibit any war commitment. It is clear. That this article owes much to Kantian idea, Kantian idea. And another reason is that at this time, neocon ideologues in America ridicule the United Nations, supported by France and Germany, as a sweet Kantian dream. So, in fact, neocon did not mention Hegel but only refers to Hobbes. But it is certain that there are different types of Hegelian from Quiam. That, that is no wonder, uh, considering that some of them were ex -protics. The United Nations would not work without a superpower power like the United States that can punish the nations that violate international law and regulations. Such criticism of the United Nations can be traced back to Hegel, who mockingly criticized Kant's design for a federation of nations. And this, this criticism has been repeated over and over again ever since. In Hegel's view, there can be no peace without a hegemonic state. For Hegel, the world history is nothing but the arena in which states compete with one another. The world historical idea is realized by a hegemonic state. He also said that, just, that such a state realized this, this idea by pursuing its own interest. Thus, the world historical idea is actualized through a subjective will or egoistic desire, as was the case with Napoleon. Hegel called this the cunning of reason. In this connection, I'd like to raise a, a couple of issues. Firstly, the United, States, uh, United Nations in the present state is far from the Kantian idea of the Federation of Nations. Secondly, Kant was not so naive as his critics have often claimed. 
Khan, in fact, had the same pessimistic view about the state and the human beings as Hobbes. He was con conscious of the deep-seated violence in human nature, which he called uh, social social being. At the same time, he believed this could be contained. Interestingly, he did not count on human intelligence or goodwill or this containment. According to Kant, the federation of states, nations, and ultimately a world republic will be brought about not by human goodwill and intelligence, but through human beings and social sociability and its concomitant war. Such a view might be called the cunning of nature, in contrast to Hegel's cunning of reason. Anyhow, Kant's optimism was thus backed by a dreadful pessimism. Nevertheless, Hegel's view was predominant throughout the 19th century. The struggle for hegemony among the empires continued and eventually resulted in the First World War. However, the devastation brought about, brought by, about by this war induced people to reconsider a Kantian notion of perpetual peace. In this, in this sense, it may be said that the League of Nations were, was actualized by the, the cunning of nature. The same is true of the United Nations, which was formed as a result of the Second World War. Another thing I would like to say is that what Kant calls perpetual peace con contains something much more than uh, the usual advocacy of peace. By, by perpetual peace, Kant means not uh, mere truth, uh, suspension of hostilities, but the end of all hostilities. To <coughs> means the end of what Hobbes called the natural state. Then, perpetual peace means superseding the state. Therefore, the Kantian argument is to be distinguished from pacifism in general. Kant called the kingdom of the ends that he did expect. A society in which the universal moral laws such as treat others as ends in themselves and not as means to an end, to an end is realized. That is a society in which capitalism and the state are superseded. Okay. But such a thing cannot be accomplished within one state alone. For instance, if nations are hostile to other, each other, and uh, one nation treat other nations as a means, there can not be a kingdom of ends. So there must be a world, world republic in order for a kingdom of ends to be realized. The Kantian metaphysics of history is to see human history as a progression toward the world republic. Then, how is his concept of a federation of, of nations located in this process of history? Uh, and <clears throat> Kant proposed to form the federation of nations instead of uh, forming the world republic immediately. In this regard, some people argue that, that Kant retreated from the original idealism of the world republic and came up with the Federation of Nations as a practically feasible plan. But from the beginning, Kant was opposed to the idea of forming a world republic immediately, which he thought would result in the world empire. Uh, okay. When he proposed the uh, <coughs> Federation of Nations, I presume that Kant came up with a, with a new view, which is completely different from Hobbes. For Hobbes,
what's the state is to find the state of, of peace from the state of nature. That is the state of war by way of social contract. But among the states, the state of nature remains never abolished. <coughs> Hegel argued, I uh, believe with this view that thought and the world order would be shaped by the struggle among the hegemonic nations. <coughs> it is evident that uh, Kantian idea of world republic is not, a, not such a thing. But I think he Kant did not clarify it. In my view, Kantian idea of the new world order is based upon a type of social contract which, which is entirely different from Hobbes. Okay. Uh, while Hobbes is based on the mode of exchange B, Kant seems to be based on mode D, that is the recovery of mode A on a higher dimension. <coughs> In this regard, I have also noticed the important problem about Kant's uh, perpetual peace. I used to think that he published it in 1795 in anticipation of the war caused by the French Revolution, namely the uh, Napoleonic War. But I noticed the fact that Kant conceived the idea of the Federation of Nations ten years before the French Revolution. It means that this was not originally conceived as a theory for peace. To begin with, Kant supported kind, a kind of democratic revolution advocated by Rousseau, and he of course supported the French Revolution. But the major difference between Kant and Rousseau is that Kant understood that such civil revolutions could not succeed without within the confines of a single nation. In his thesis prior to the French Revolution, Kant remarked, the problem of, of establishing a perfect civil constitution quote, uh, depends on the problem of low government external relations among nations and cannot be solved unless the latter is. Defensive war of France. 
bank can into an apparently invasive one and led to the world war called the Napoleonic War. Kant published the Perpetual Peace in 1795 because he anticipated such a thing. But it is not for preventing the hanging war that he thought of Perpetual Peace. In his view, civil revolution within one nation failed uh, and led to the World War. So, we should say that the Kantian design to stop World War was not motivated by a simple desire for peace, but rather a desire to complete the civil revolution, complete the civil revolution. In this sense, it may be said that Kant's perpetual peace was a design to associate the civil revolutions in, in, in each nation with each other. That, that is to say, it was a design for simultaneous world revolution. Uh, this is effective in um, in thinking about social revolutions, socialist revolutions as well. The fact that Perpetual Peace was published in 1795 uh, confined Kant's view only to peace map. <coughs> but repeatedly, it should be noted that Kantian design for peace was originally meant for simultaneous world revolution. French, uh, French Revolution led to World War because it was not a simultaneous world revolution. This Napoleonic War gave rise to many capital nation states in Europe. Hegel found a cunning reason there. But that was only to proliferate the capital nation states and establish modern world system. The perspective for superseding it was opened up by Kant and Marx. Finally, uh, a few words about the World, world Republic. As I already said, overcoming the natural state among, na among nations, according to Hobbesian principles, will eat the Leviathan, named the world state. Each nation alienates their sovereignty to it. They obtain the security in exchange for submitting to the world state. This is a more real exchange. In this direction, however, there is no perpetual peace, but the state of war will persist. In the meantime, as I understand, uh, the Federation of Nations proposed by Kant should not be based upon Hobbesian principles that is more deep. <coughs> it should be based upon the more deep. What will it be like? I suggest it. I suggest that the main D is recovering from mode A on a higher di dimension. The tribal competency is a world system based upon the mode A. In other words, power of gift or mana, which is stronger than the military power. This will be a good example to presume how the world system based upon mode D can be formed. The United Nations were sure, was sure based upon a Kantian idea, but it's far from it. The United Nations is based upon Hobbesian principle. In other words, it is ordered by and also utilized by the hegemonic nations. But despite the, their insufficiency, we need not think of creating something other than uh, this, say, something like the new version of the international. The new international. The United Nations is not just some idea that was cooked up by the human mind. Rather, it is a legacy of the query of human nature. Why not make, make full use of it? The United Nations can become a system against the capital nation states, apart from how it was shaped and how it functions in reality. The new world system will be born from changing the existing United Nations. But changing the United Nations is, is not made possible by diplomacy and struggle between nations, but by the counter movement against the capital and the state within each nation. And those movements contain the states and 
impact the phone below. But at the same time, those counter movements would be easily divided and undermined by the state of the capitals without such institutions as the United Nations that can contain the states and the capital. Therefore, counter movement in each nation should have the common goal to change the United, United Nations. That will make it possible to contain the state capital, state and capitals from above. Then how can we be organized the United Nations on non-Hegelian, non-Hocusian principles? It is possible for each nation to gift, uh, donate, middle sovereignty to the United Nations voluntarily. This is not alienation, but gifting or donation. Okay. Uh, to be more specific, but let me take uh, uh, Japan for example. After the Second World War, Japan has had a constitution uh, which prohibited the war and the armament. Of course, it was not carried out. So, Japanese should just carry it out. That is, gift merely sovereignty to the United Nations. How would other nations react to it? They can do anything. Many nations would get into line, so, and, and that would change the United Nations. Of course, it would, would require, require a revolution for the Japanese to do so, and, but that is not impossible. The other nations would do it if the Japanese do, do not. It, it, well, it, would not matter. it would not matter who does it. And even if it takes place in one nation, it can be a simultaneous world.